Hello, and welcome to the Enneagram 2.0 podcast. I'm Beatrice Chestnut. I'm Uranio Pais. And today we're talking about Uranio Pais. Ooh. <laughs> really? Yes, we're going to uh, do another in our series of podcasts focusing on understanding one specific type at a deeper level. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so today our topic is Type 5 Secrets Unveiled. Oh, <laughs> wow, that's a little scary because us fives um, try to hold on to our secrets. Yes, I know, I know. But I'm up for it. Let's go. Okay, so in, an, in, in another podcast, we explained all nine types. So there's something about five types in that one, just the personality characteristics generally. And in another podcast, we explain the growth path of each of the nine types. And this podcast is one of a series of podcasts in which we'll focus more on each of the nine types and probably in the long run, the 27 subtypes, because as we often say, we don't just focus on the nine types. We believe we need to understand the three versions of the nine types, the three instinct-based subtypes. Uh, however, today we'll focus on interviewing a specific five who is on a growth path, because we think it's very important to understand not just what the types look like uh, at a superficial level, but to really get a deep sense of what each type looks like, what they experience when they're on a path, a true path of self-development. Right, so our idea for this podcast is that you, our listener, um, can uh, be in touch with people who have been doing inner work, and therefore we're not only going to talk about personality traits, but rather uh, we are going to talk more about the nine paths of development. And uh, for this, we are going to interview always students of ours on Chestnut Pies Enneagram Academy, who are doing good work in our opinion and our analysis. And why not, you know, self-disclosing a little bit about ourselves, B? I hope um, that um, students will appreciate that. And, um, you know, I'll interview you eventually as a type two also. Exactly, exactly. I think uh, what we often say, we wouldn't ask anyone else to do something we're not willing to do ourselves. As yeah as part of the path of growth, using the Enneagram as a tool or a map. And I think um, we need to start sharing with our listeners that um, you and I are a work in progress. Yes. Like we are not, uh, we can't say that we are evolved, but we're doing a good job. And uh, so please don't mystify us as, we've, as if we were uh, already... Um, um, people without egos. We are not. Right. When I wrote the book, The Complete Enneagram, whenever I would think about anything I wanted to say in the book, I would always think about it from the perspective of we. You know, we're doing this, we're doing that, because um, the, one of the reasons why I love the Enneagram and why I've learned a lot about it and why I, you know, I share it with others is because it helped me so much to understand myself. And that's the first reason always, I think, to mm. to focus on the Enneagram is is from the perspective of how does it help me grow? And and so I think that's it, yes. it's been really central for me mm -hmm. to always be asking myself and asking my friends like you to give me feedback and both be a companion with me on the path, but also mm to support me on my path and, and help me make sure that I'm not inadvertently or unconsciously sort of slipping back into maybe just making an excuse for my patterns and not challenging my ego all yes, the time. Yes, thank you for uh, bringing this up. I mean, um, I think it's uh, at a certain point getting uh, honest feedback for, from friends on the path becomes uh, one of the biggest blessings ever because we are not capable of seeing everything. And by the way, on this series, I believe that you, uh, our listener, is going to hear our interviewees, including ourselves, share 
uh, stories that will sound really ego-driven, but the difference is the capacity to see them, to acknowledge them, to tell the, those stories in a less identified way. So when people grow up at a certain point, up to a certain point, it's not that they are getting rid of their egos, but they are capable of detaching from it while from it from them uh, while watching them from the outside, watching all the tendencies. Then um, on a later step, people will be able to not have those ego-driven reactions. Right. And on another podcast, we'll discuss, we'll discuss our levels of awareness model, mm -hmm. which is, I yeah. think, something you're referring to that at different levels of self-awareness or self-development work, different tasks and different focuses are called for. Yes. But before we get too far into the, that, I think it's important to come back to our focus today, which is on unveiling the secrets of type five. I think I was trying to get away from that. I had that sense that maybe you were starting to go into some off ramp uh, because today, oh, my ego. <laughs> today you have agreed to allow me to interview you as a type five uh, to really understand much more about this type than many people often do. So I have a request to you, B. Okay. When I talk about me, I'll possibly have a tendency to start talking about type five. Ah. And this is a type five strategy to mm. be less personal. Mm. So can you call me back to talk about myself yes. and not about type five, if I'd, I do that? I'd be honored. Thank you for asking. Before we delve deeper into understanding the Type 5 growth path based on my interviewing you, can you give us some basic information about the Type 5 personality style? Sure. So this will be information about who I believe fives are and who certainly I, I am um, when I'm not experiencing higher levels of awareness, when I'm more basic or when fives are more basic, which we sometimes describe as being more uh, in personality itself. Right? right, right. Okay, so a few things. One is that we contract from, from life force. We are not fully available to live life. Um, it's like detaching from life itself. Another thing is disconnection from people, from what they are saying in a conversation, um, um, you know, hiding out in our heads, our thoughts. But it's not only detaching from conversations, and not even from people only. It's more detaching from feelings and detaching, again, from life, from what's happening like with this tendency of thinking of uh, things, thinking of feelings and thinking of sensations. In a way, it's like uh, becoming theoretical about the practicity of things happening all around us. The practicality? Practicality, yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, um, another thing is the, uh, it's how much privacy we need. Some people think they are fives because they... They like privacy sometimes. They like to be, they need time yeah. alone, let's say. And I think that almost everybody does. Yes, me too. But that's not my case. My case is I need privacy all the time if I'm in touch with my personality. And if I can't have it, I make it happen. Even if I'm in public, I create a bubble around me and I feel disconnected. And uh, if I'm in personality, that's a process that not, not only happens all the time, but, but one that I can't control. Right. So fives get good at being alone even when they're physically with other people. Yes. And controlling uh, everybody else in their pace. Uh, uh, for when they will be okay not being alone anymore. Like dictating the time for everything, controlling time, space, and energy as resources that nobody can control ours, but we can control everybody's. Right, and that's a bit connected to the idea of scarcity, right? Yes, and of course, um, 
uh, the, the fixation and the passion of type are always very central. So the passion is the, vi the, the emotional vice and it's avarice. But I was referring a bit more to stinginess, which is the fixation, the name of the fixation of type 5. The mental pattern. Mental pattern, limiting belief. Right. Uh, but the passion of Everest is one that shuts down our hearts uh, for receiving and giving. Uh, so it's like not being able to receive anyone's love and not being able to give our love freely detaching as observers and finding it difficult therefore to go with the flow of life and the flow of love right right and and fives are head types so they may think about feelings as opposed to actually feeling their emotions is that right yes exactly Okay, yeah. so I appreciate you giving us this short recap of some of the main characteristics of the type 5 personality, uh, because I think that helps people understand at a base level what the type 5 personality is about. But remember, we have another podcast that describes all nine types in a bit more detail. So if people want more information about the personality style itself, they can refer to that, po that podcast as well. So now let's turn to the focus of this podcast, which is me interviewing you uh, as a type five on a growth path to understand a lot more than just what you just uh, recounted for us, to understand much more about the ego uh, fixation, the ego patterns of type five, and especially how the work can happen for a type five based on your experience. Yes, I can speak for myself, but hopefully other fives will uh, resonate with uh, a few things that I'll share. And if you have a close relationship with a five, hopefully you will understand your dear five a little more and know what to do, what not to do, and to have more compassion. Exactly. I think this this any interview hopefully will be valuable for fives themselves, or if you're a five and you want to understand yourself at a deeper level, but also for people who have fives in their lives who may not understand fives because how can you if you're not in their skin, if you're not inside their subjective experience? So first question I'd like to ask you is, could you tell us what you understand about your ego patterns that you didn't understand before? Mm. Now that you've been working on self-observation and developing more of an inner witness and uh, learning about your patterns over over many years? Um, so two things come to my mind um, when I hear you asking me this. The first one is that in the very beginning, I would have knowledge and mental curiosity and mental activity fuel in all my inner space in a way that I wouldn't feel any pain. So it would fill in all your internal experience. Yes, mm -hmm. in a way that I wouldn't feel any pain mm. and anything being wrong. I was simply just okay with that. I mean, not completely, because in my teenage years, I will already... I would already have some typical five tendencies of feeling like I was weird in some ways. In my case, it was like not being as spontaneous as other people. And also, you know, looking at my body in a way that I was distorting it because I was too slim uh, in my teenage years. So, but deep inside, those were projections, I think, of my my uh, my tendency as a five to feel weird. Kind of when, when you say weird, do you mean sort of like you don't fit in with other people, yeah. maybe socially too awkward? different, socially awkward. Well, although because I'm a social dominant subtype, I, uh, I I found my ways to to fit in socially. But in the inside, I didn't feel like other people, like I felt different. I see. And I hear many fives uh, reporting the same, um, like different. 
So spontaneity is just one aspect of that. The thing is that I would try to be more smart and, and, and try to fill in the gaps the, uh, involved with feeling weird and feeling less than by, you know, acquiring knowledge, hoarding knowledge and trying to have understandings of life, people that were really differentiated. Um, but I was not in touch at all with something which was a void inside, especially, a, a, you know, a void in my heart, you know, that naturally comes from avarice when you shut your heart down for re both receiving and giving, there is emptiness and avarice doesn't uh, feel good at all. But the strategy of feeling the heart space with something that doesn't belong to the heart space, which is mental content, made me believe that I didn't lack anything and all was fine. So the first thing that I saw only later on on the path was the lack in my heart. I couldn't see that in the beginning. And the pain of disconnection and the pain of uh, loneliness. So that leads me to the second thing that I believe I learned only later on the path. So before you go to the second thing, I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying because yes. I think there's so much in it. Uh, so it sounds like what you're saying is the lack of spontaneity was related to sort of needing to think about things too much and not be able to just respond in the moment, maybe from a more emotional place or from a more uh, kind of organic place of almost needing to go inside and process mentally. Is that what you mean by spontaneity? Yes. And as a way not to look at the void in my heart. Ah, okay. And so it also sounds like, uh, in another way, like feeling different or having this void of being in your heart or maybe being more connected to emotions and your yourself in, in that at that emotional level that you compensated in a way through gaining more knowledge or being someone who could think about things in a very sophisticated way and maybe uh, have an identity connected to being very knowledgeable. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it is. Uh, but I'm also saying that a big step that was very hard but important um, to me was when I could really feel into the pain in my heart for not having been more connected to myself, to others, having lost time mm. in that. But I couldn't see that at all and mainly feel that at all in the beginning. In the beginning, you couldn't feel that. But at a certain point, you got more in touch with yes. that experience. And I believe that that's important for all fives. For all fives. To be in touch directly with that pain. That heart pain, right. not an understanding. It's right. it's an actual heartfelt pain. Pain at not being more connected to people, to life, to, and to my heart, to your own heart. Yeah. Uh, wow, that sounds very important. And again, it sounds like when we're in personality, one of the functions of personality as a defensive self structure is that it defends us against certain very important painful experiences yes. that we have as part of growing and that when you're on a growth path when you're when you're doing self development in a conscious way one of the things that will happen and that is a good thing is getting in touch with specific painful experiences that can open you up when you're more conscious of them. So it sounds like what you're saying is uh, that's part of what's helped you to grow, even though it might not have been comfortable, uh, is that you got in touch at a certain point with the pain that associated your disconnection from life, from people, from your own emotions and your own heart. Right. I think this, you said it all. Um, and the, the second thing was um, that I... I, it was very easy for me to see the aspect that everybody talks about when talking about fives, which is they don't like other people to invade their territory. Yeah. Emotionally, physically, and, and you know, just 
they want to push people away. Mm -hmm. That's easy to see. Right. And I saw that quite easily. But only later on, I realized that there is this one thing that's harder for me than people invading my space. And that is when people go away from my space. Oh, uh, wow. So the f people talk all the time and fives acknowledge all the time that they want privacy. But not many people talk about a, a deeper feeling of how hurtful it is for me as a five when people go away from me. Right. And that sounds really important. And even for me, as someone who's in your life and it was having a relationship with you, and so I can even speak from a personal point of view here, and that is that from the outside, I often only see the behaviors that you display and the things that you say about needing space, needing time to yourself. And there's a way that I can get the message that I need to go away. And, and as a two, especially, you know, it, my buttons get pushed and I need to own this myself, that it can feel like rejection to me or like the threat of rejection. So when you say I need space or I want some time to myself, on the one hand, I really want to give that to you because I care about you and I want to meet your needs. Uh, and so I can, but I can have the tendency to go too much away. And what I'm hearing from you is what it may be harder for you to communicate and even for some fives to feel and experience consciously is that there is also a pain if I go too far away or if someone in your life goes away. Yes. And that's, again, a heartfelt thing. And when we feel things directly, we lack the words to explain that or to make sense of it for ourselves and what you say to others you know so it's very hard to understand and communicate that and then we take time and the other goes away and the more the person goes away the more hurtful it is and then we feel hopeless right and it sounds like we'll talk a little bit more about relationship patterns later to make sure we cover this because i think it's such an important point uh, but it sounds like this can contribute to a problematic dynamic between mm -hmm. fives and the people they're in relationship with because... I want you, but I don't. Yes. And I don't, but I do. Yes. So it's very paradoxical. We know I know how hard it is for people to relate to me, at least. And I see how hard it is for people to relate with fives because it looks like we're sending, um, you know, ambivalent messages or just one message, you know, yeah. go away. Mm -hmm. And yet that's not the full story. And it may be harder for you to communicate uh, another message, like don't go too far away, or I don't mean for you to completely disconnect or or lose hope in, in being close to me. Yes. But that that part may be harder to verbalize. Yes. Yeah, very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do you think has helped you the most to see and break away from your specific ego patterns as a five? Mm, let me think a bit. Maybe what practices, what growth experiences, what new learnings about yourself and, and this personality? So in my particular case, um, I think that one of the breakthroughs was learning to be more in my body and have access to instincts. I like to call it my connection to the the eight point with my arrow to eight, uh, point eight on the Enneagram symbol. Uh, but I see that it's not like this for some other fives. It's for for some, some fives, it's what I've just said, but for other fives, it's more like having a heartbreak straight on without the body. So I think that Getting out of the head is the answer. Right. So having some sort of experience, out of the head experience. Right, right. Which for us, we feel like out out of this life experience because we try to, to summarize life or to, um, uh, uh, you know, to make as if life is only a head uh, experience, a mental experience. Mm. So having an experience that is not is 
how do you say it in English? Discombobulating? <laughs> yes, very good. You can see how amazing your vocabulary is, well, despite not being a native English speaker. Well, us fives are, uh, you know, we focus on, on what we don't know yet mm. and not what we do. Ah. So I keep asking you to correct my English because I want to learn. Yes. So now can you... I want to get even more personal here because I, I think I so appreciate the way you're always uh, seeking to understand yourself at a deeper level. What specific experiences have you had in your life that helped you get more into your body or more into your heart? Well, for me, it was first um, um, experiences with particular meditations I was doing. I remember to this day something that happened like 20 plus years ago um, when I was doing a, an active meditation and all of a sudden my head turned off and my body took control. Can you say what, what an active meditation is? So sometimes people know meditation only as the passive meditation, passive kind of meditation, which is the silent uh, meditation in which usually we sit down and push thoughts, feelings and sensations away uh, gently. Um, but sometimes it's difficult for people to get to that point straight on. And, you know, there are some meditations that are more dynamic. And when you you do the dynamic part of them, you get more ready to the passive part in which you sit down in silence. So so the dynamic meditation would be sort of actively doing something with your body. Yes. And we can meditate with, um, you know, in anything, with everything we do in life. Right. It's like a meditative state right. that we can have while washing the dishes, you know. Right. But um, that, <clears throat> perhaps I shouldn't even call it meditation, that was the Sufi weirding dance that I practiced for several years weekly. And at a certain point, I started to be whirled. Whirled. To be whirled. Whirled. Instead, yes, of, instead whirling of whirling yourself. And that was a turning off of my head that was new. And my body took control. But actually didn't because, you know, the body was just spontaneously doing movements. And in the beginning, very, um, very energized movements, very uh, vigorous movements while I whirled. And I knew that they were okay because I wouldn't lose my balance. And um, my arms would uh, move in crazy ways that I would never have believed I was able to do. And I would stretch and twist in ways that I didn't know I was capable of doing and not losing my balance while whirling. But that, that's a very particular experience. I, what I want to say is that, again, I believe what helped me, and, but also helps fives in general, I hear this from them, um, is having an out-of-the-head experience. Yeah. So that, the main point there is that you had an experience of being completely in your body as opposed to just living life from, from your head, which is where you had been experiencing your life mostly from. Yes. Yeah. And in my case, I did not experience uh, until much more recently my heart blowing open. It was for me, my body, getting access to my body mm -hmm. first. Yeah. And so what about the heart? How, how have you worked to get more in touch with the heart as a way of creating more balance? Well, later on, um, I think I had two or three experiences um, very facilitated by you know, very wise teachers I had um, of feeling into the pain in a way that I couldn't, I, I couldn't use my head and like being out of control mm. in, in a painful emotional experiences. Like one of those made me fall down while I was walking on a street and stay there crying and crying and crying and could I couldn't help myself or in therapy sessions or in some other places it's like to me it had to be losing control 
and and feeling incapable of using my head to control my feelings. Maybe because I had accumulated a lot of experience of being in control, I had to do that. Maybe maybe I had a more uh, radical experience of using my head too much mm -hmm. and not having too much my heart open. Maybe above average for fives in that way. But so I had to leave more radical experiences like these. Mm -hmm. And so how hard was it for you to have that kind of an ex heart opening experience? It's funny because, of course, it was very hard, but even during those moments, there was relief, mm. like feeling that I had a heart. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and what happened next uh, always was amazing. Mm -hmm. you okay. know, it was um, experiencing life through my heart in ways that I can't really describe. Let's do a short break. If you liked this podcast, visit www.cpenneagram.com for much more great Enneagram content. Be and Yiranyu offer much, much more high quality Enneagram content on www.cpenneagram.com. If you are an Enneagram enthusiast, visit the website now, www.cpenneagram.com. So what other things can you tell us about your inner experience, uh, whether they're difficult experiences or positive experiences that most people don't understand about fives? Hmm. It's what, what is, you know, it's very difficult for us to tell you. I mean... Many times we feel so much love for the other person in front of us. And the words don't come and the courage of expressing that doesn't come. And then when the person assumes that we're not feeling anything, it's very, very um, hard for us. It hurts a lot. Yeah, that sounds important in two ways. One just the difficulty of verbalizing feelings that you're having inside. But also, I think a lot of people who may just see fives on the outside and not understand what's going on inside may have the misconception that fives don't feel or that fives are incapable of feeling their emotions. I think that in the very beginning, I need to say, it would be true to say that I felt really not much, that I felt too little. But then uh, later on, I would feel a lot, but still not be able to communicate and, and, and have a hard time um, showing vulnerable feelings to an extent that I would be watching a movie and feel emotional and started crying. But then when someone like my wife, my daughter, my son would look at me, the tears would almost dry up. Uh, immediately so I would be feeling but not expressing and then expressing emotions is this second level of development at least for me uh, that is you know we need we need to be very courageous mm -hmm. as fives to do so I think that a good way to understand it is that the specific fear that fives have and mental types come from what we call the fear triad five sixes and sevens i think the specific fear fives have that differentiate them from sixes and sevens is the fear of feeling that that the fear you experience most often or whether it's conscious or not is about feeling emotions themselves yeah and because we we don't believe that we are going to be met by others at that moment mm, what do you mean by that um if we open up our hearts, we'll open up to an extremely big need of others that we have been um, avoiding throughout life. And, th and the fear is people won't give me all I need. Mm -hmm. And then I retract back and I close mm -hmm. my heart down again because I won't get what I need. 
So I, I remember what David Daniels used to say, which is, um, you know, this belief that life demands too much and gives too little. Right. And I can imagine that is a real threat because, like you're saying, it can be hard for uh, for you to express your needs and express those emotions in a way where other people can maybe understand. And if you make an attempt, uh, someone may not get it. And someone, especially a heart type like me, right, who might ex express my emotions in a different way, when you do it in your way, especially if it's a new thing, I may not, I may not understand, and yes. I may not meet you there. I may not appreciate the effort behind what you're doing when you're trying to e express more of your need or more of your feeling. Yes, and what I think we need from others in this on this regard is patience, because we are slower, mm -hmm. emotionally speaking. Right. Uh, we are not as competent, and, and it's hard. At least in my case, I, I, I felt, and I still do to an extent, a little childish or less experienced with things that were so easy for others. Like for you, as my very good friend, a two, uh, it's so easy for you to get in touch and express emotions that when I look at myself, I tend to feel ridiculous. And then... I stop blaming myself, I stop judging, and I bring some more uh, gentleness to my heart, and I comfort it, um, just, you know, acknowledging it's hard yeah. for me as a five. And little by little, I may be more and more in touch with those vulnerable feelings that you can have. But what is important for me is to have people around me understand my process, and not giving up on me and being patient because I'm much slower than anyone else in terms of uh, doing my emotional work. Right, right. I once heard a five say on an Enneagram panel that, uh, that the problem in his marriage with his ex-wife <laughs> uh, was that she was a four and he was a five and he said if emotions were money, she was a millionaire and he had maybe 20 pennies. And when she was always asking him to show more emotion and when he would try and would give he, when he would give her about six or eight of his 20 pennies, she would think it was nothing. Uh, and so I think there can be a difficulty in communication with others, uh, like you're saying, because it can, you can make a big effort to either share your feelings or share your difficulty around sharing feelings. And you may really need to be understood and be met around that. And it sometimes may be hard for us to really understand you because our experience is just different. Yes. And besides understanding, what I think we need is that patience of um, not invading the space when that is happening, but also not going away. Yes. It's staying staying nearby yes. and and being sensitive to what might be happening with you yeah and sensitive to the uh, precise distance we need you to have from us which is never too close but also never too far away well that sounds like very important information that that not everyone knows about relating to fives yeah it's there is an extremely sensitive heart in the inside I have another question about this. I've heard fives say that it's easier to feel their emotions when they're by themselves and harder when they're actually with people. Uh, to me, it's fear be just that. But it's hard. It was hard for me to spot that as fear. My sensation, and maybe this has to do with my instinctual sequence. I think that other fives can do it more easily than I did. So, But for me, it was very hard to name it as fear because initially it feels like a lack of willingness only mm -hmm. to share emotions. But it's not only that. It's just the fear that, again, we won't be met in our needs, emotional needs. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Can you tell us about some ego patterns that you have as a five that are still difficult for you to break away from? Yes. Crying is one. You mean... Crying. Being I mean, able to cry. Yeah. Ah. That's difficult. And it's like, I feel like I'm getting in touch with my emotions much more than before. But there is something in me that um, is different from those experiences I had of crying nonstop that I mentioned earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, because I tried to be in control. And I feel it's like a feeling of being incompetent uh, when I compare myself to others. I see people simply crying and I would like to be c capable of doing more of that. <laughs> yes. You know, because I know that that would help me. Mm. Another thing, and maybe this also be, has to do with being a man. Um, and I think that society is a little more cruel with us men. Yes. Uh, in terms of, you know, those... Um, beliefs, ancestral beliefs that men don't cry. Right. And conditioning that it's not okay for men to share emotions or they're weak if they do. Yes. Um, what else? Um, I'm still working on um, believing that my energy is bigger than it is. Mm. I tend to think it will finish at any time. And then I need to um, go be alone, sleep, or have my alone time doing whatever, you know, it could be reading, could be just having some distraction and just breathing in because I finally whew, can whew, breathe in without spending energy in relationships. It's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so different from you. I mm -hmm. see you getting energized more and more when you relate to people. And there is this feeling for me that relationships drain my energy. It's the opposite. <laughs> right? Yes. Can I say something funny about you? Please. So the other night at one of our inner work retreats, we had on the last night a come as you aren't party. And you came as a heart type. Yes. And I laughed all night. It was hard for me to stay in my own character, which was, what was my character? I was, I came as an insensitive bitch. <laughs> and it was yeah. hard for me to stay in character because every, every time I looked at you, I laughed so hard because of the permanent smile you had on your face. And also when we were walking to the party, you said, don't say anything funny because... I'm resting my face muscles because you were anticipating how much you would smile at other people as a heart type. Yeah, but yeah, that was very hard to keep smiling all the time. <laughs> but there was one thing that was harder, and that was to stay in front of people and very close to them without a break. <laughs> It's like uh, I would see myself wanting to just go around the room for a few seconds to disconnect just this tiny little bit, mm. you know, and I couldn't because I was a hard time, <laughs> you know. And you were going around connecting to everyone. But then towards the end of the evening, I didn't feel tired. Wow. So there is this belief that uh, my energy will be totally drained mm. if I stay connected, which is not true. It's a limiting belief, but it's very hard because it's a body sense that I'm, I'm going to sleep, I'm going to die if I stay. Mm. Um, so I need to come back to my space and rest. I think that at times I need to acknowledge I'm tired. I need to sleep more for whatever reason. But many times it's just a limiting belief. Right. It's a belief in scarcity and maybe uh, a lack of focus on the abundance that's really there, whether yeah. it's love or support mm. or people who just want to be connected to you. Yeah. But it doesn't help me when anyone around me uh, say, I need you or that's not true or anything that I feel judgmental. So when you feel judged by others around any of your own yeah, patterns? Or pressed. Or, um, or pushed into pushed, doing yeah, yeah, something? Pushed. Because I think, again, I'm overly sensitive. 
and people don't know that. See, that's an important piece. I want to stop you right there because I think this is really a big one. I think a lot of people think of fives as being insensitive because they can be quiet, which makes them seem aloof and they're not so comfortable being forthcoming with information about what's going on inside them. Let's say if they're feeling different, like you said, or awkward. They don't always say that. And sometimes we on the outside read fives as being aloof or distant or arrogant. And if I may add, um, th there is this myth or the teaching of the Enneagram of personality that fives don't care about image, don't care about be seen or being, be seen. being seen or emotionally mad. And Yes, in personality, we are disconnected from that need. But I think this is the deepest need we actually have. Right. Like, I, I don't think there is anything more important for my true heart than be seen and feel met. So when people don't uh, really understand and feel my pain and my difficulty in connecting, I, f I feel bad. I feel judged also, and I feel simply not understood. And there is this very big, mostly unconscious need to not feel that way. Yeah. And for some reason, I'm wanting to apologize to you right now because I know sometimes I make that mistake. But that, you're doing a great job. Yeah. I'm yeah. open to hearing that feedback because um, it's true. Sometimes I get a little bit too focused on my own needs that I might not be aware of or I might not speak, whether it's to be uh, seen by you or to spend time with you or to be understood. And I think I don't recognize your needs sometimes. And again, as a two, we can I can be prideful about meeting others' needs, but I think there's a way that sometimes I do judge you uh, in a way that's very... Um, that I really regret and that I really appreciate you whenever you share how you really feel or tell me what's true for you or tell me that I'm out of line in judging you because I think I can do that and I don't ever intend to. Yes. But we all get caught up in our own stuff and mm -hmm. that can come up for me because my relationship with yeah. you is important to me. Yes. And uh, thank you. And I apologize for my reactivity when that happens, which is to withdraw and to be even more distant. Yeah. Distant. Yeah, I think there can we can have a negative dynamic in that way. Yeah. So maybe this brings us to uh, the topic of relationship patterns. And I know that I've seen a lot of people who can get very confused in relationship with fives and get into negative dynamics like the one we've just named. Can you let us know from your point of view, uh, what do you think are some of the relationship patterns that you have as a five that may be hard for other people to understand? Feeling hurt. People don't see that. Uh, and it happens intensely all the time. Because as we said before, some people think of fives as insensitive, but yes. actually fives are very sensitive. Yeah. But like you're saying, because you don't always show your re reaction or response to feeling hurt or sensitive. I don't always know oh. that I'm feeling hurt. I and see. because I go too fast to the reactivity of feeling hurt because of my fear of feelings, which is withdrawing and and and, and feeling cold. Like oh. close closing, you know, down the doors of emotions. But if I observe more in a more subtle way, what happened is that I felt hurt. Mm. And fives feel hurt all the time, in my view. At least I do. Yeah. And, and are you saying that some fives may avoid actually experiencing that hurt and some fives may be in very direct touch with it, depending yeah. on how much inner work they've done? Yes. But I, perhaps I would say it differently because when you say fives may avoid it, it it feels like the head has some control over the uh, process while right. it doesn't right. so it's simply an, an incapacity of the heart at that stage because we haven't done muscle work with the heart like mm -hmm. a gym heart's gym <laughs> um, um, uh, in order to be able to feel the pain and stain it 
so I, th I think there is no option when we are in personality to keep feeling that. Right. Keeping feeling hurt. To allowing yourself to feel hurt and eventually be able to speak from that hurt to communicate to others yeah. what's going on Exactly. For you. So it's both, in my view, a heart's incapacity and the fact that we feel more hurt than the average person. There is a lot of sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it's a lot, we protect our hearts more. Mm -hmm. Like one of the most amazing things that I was uh, told by a teacher in the past was that the biggest padlocks are the ones that protect the biggest treasures. Mm, so like it's that. like it's like um, my heart is full of sensitivity and this is why I need to protect it more. That sounds really clear. Anything else you can say about fives, patterns in relationship, uh, maybe in terms of fears or how you experience anger or sadness? <sighs> anger was a very important emotion for me to get in touch with because, at least in my case, it was the emotion that helped me open my heart further to all other emotions. It was the doorway into my heart. And again, I think it's the arrow to eight. Mm -hmm. um, but the drama is that when I get more assertive or even you know a little angry, mm -hmm. not everyone around me is okay with that because it, it's felt by many people as if I'm... Uh, I'm not as calm as I used to, to be or uh, not as nice. But what I'm actually trying to say when I'm angry at you is don't go away. Mm. You know, yeah. you, it, 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 so being angry to me is a movement from apathy towards love. I'm not yet capable of expressing love, but at least I'm saying something to you. Right. You know, and, yeah. And I'm engaging. Yeah. It's a form of connection. Yeah. Yeah. Or trying to reestablish connection. That makes sense. Can you tell us any secret wishes of being a five or just that you have as a five that some of us may not imagine that you have? I think that it's living a life of joy, which to a great extent, we may believe is not possible for us as fives. Another secret wish is whenever I say go away that you don't. Another wish is to be hugged and taken care of, uh, but hug me tight, mm -hmm. not loosely, you know? And we will never tell you this, I think, or <laughs> almost never. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I remember to these days when I was starting on the Enneagram and I was on a panel uh, facilitated by Helen Palmer and David Daniels and a five by my, side, my, by my side said, don't play our game. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, if we tell you that we want you to go away, don't. You know, because we're not really meaning that from the bottom of the heart. Mm. But also don't come closer at that moment. Be a little patient. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, find out the moment that the five is breathing again and allowing you to come in. And it could be as subtle as this. If you see that I'm inhaling again and a little more deeply, it's an invitation for you to come closer. <laughs> <laughs> I love learning the secret language of fives. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Uh, and I think another thing that's uh, that you're saying that's so beautiful is we we tend to assume we may know what's in your head and your heart as a five, but we're often projecting our own assumptions, conclusions, uh, expectations, and we need to be really careful of that because uh, we live on different planets in a way. Yeah, and from a five's perspective, I think that we are waiting for someone 
who's truly willing to read uh, the mystery we uh, show everybody else, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. To kind of stay patient and be interested enough mm -hmm. uh, to allow for some mystery, yeah. to allow for some distance. Interested enough is good. And, interested you know, not enough. many people are. Yeah. What do you think you expect from others but may never tell them? Yeah, I think, you know, the things we've talked about, actually, that they don't go away, that they are patient, that they don't play our game, that they are interested enough, and that they, uh, at the right moment, come really closer. And I think that it's a good idea if you do that and give me a tight hug. You quickly look at my eyes right after that, and then you leave. <laughs> it's like, give me that tight hug, look at me quickly, but don't stay in front of me looking at me, waiting for an answer right away, because I feel incompetent to give you the same spontaneity you gave me. I mean, I don't feel I'm uh, like that anymore. I I, f I feel very happy for being able to be more spontaneous in my life and to act from my heart right now, but it's not easy. Yeah. So what do you think is different now versus before? Before you were more farther down your growth path than you are now? I think I'm happier. I think that uh, by being able to be more in my heart without a head and in my body without a head and in my body and heart without a head and then integrate the head proportionally you know in things that the head is useful for i think that makes me happy uh, but this is really recent like I thought in the past that from my 40s I would be in there. I had this wish that I would be there in my 40s. Be where? In happiness. Ah. Oh. But I think that I'm getting there in my 50s. So 10-year mm. deficit. <laughs> but uh, I'm, you know, I'm getting there. Well, I, I'm not sure yet if I'll be able to sustain myself in there. But having this feeling is new and amazing. I'm really happy to hear you say this because I think, as you know, I've told you many times, sometimes as someone who really cares about you, it seems to me you have kind of a low bar for your own happiness. Yes. Like it's not something you focus on. Yes. And I think it's connected to what you've described to me as a lack of a belief in abundance or an yes. openness to abundance that yeah. it's scary to think yeah. that you could be happy or receive yeah. more love in a real way yes and i think it's avarice also the passion of type five uh you know just not opening up for uh, to all it can be right and then the belief patterns kind of support that uh in ways that we aren't always conscious of that that you tend to believe in scarcity and not so much in abundance and that reinforces the tendency that it takes a lot of work to wake up out of yeah yeah yes so i'm glad to hear i'm glad to hear that um, anything else that's different now than before in terms of your growth path as a five mm. i think as a result of what i've just said spontaneity is a good thing um, you know, being allowing, being able to be more fun, um, you know, and to and not only in those moments I choose to, you know, it's when fun, the, my fun side comes up. Um, also, be willing to experience things uh, before I make sense of the upcoming experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are a few things. It's like allowing experience to happen instead yeah. of anticipating it in your yes. head and maybe trying to plan or control it. Yes, jumping more uh, quickly into the unknown, you know? Yes. It's interesting because I'm just reflecting on, on our relationship as you're saying these things. 
Uh, and this is something I don't think I've that's occurred to me lately. And that is that, you know, you and I were friends many years ago when we were on the board of directors of the International Enneagram Association. So I knew you then we were friends. Yeah. But now that we're working together, you know, it's it's, you know, what, 15 years later uh, from the first time that we started working together in several years ago. And one of the things I'm realizing is, you know, I think of you now as one of the funniest people I know. Wow. And if I think of you <laughs> then, I, I, I mean... One I of thought, the boris, well, <laughs> most boring people you knew. No, I never thought of you as boring, but I thought of you as more serious. And, wow. and I don't think that I really saw the extent of your sense of humor in a way that I do now. And so let me tell you, I can't uh, tell how many times in my life I heard from all sorts of people, including teachers, that I, I, I was serious or, uh, you know, a disciplined good boy, which actually didn't match what I really was. But I can tell you that there was not even one single time that I heard this that didn't hurt me. Oh, wow. Wow. Hmm. Wow. Because this was all I didn't want to be. Wow. In my case... I think my quest can be explained as a quest for spontaneity. Wow. And it sounds like when you're more identified with the five personality, there's a way that it sort of locks you out of your own spontaneity, your own natural yes. uh, maybe connection to all of you. you know? But I've always longed for uh, that. Yes, that's, that's beautiful. Let's do a short break. B and Udanio teach in-person, inner work retreats and professional workshops all over the world. They happen twice a year in California, London, Shanghai, Sao Paulo, and Cairo, and sometimes in other countries and U.S. locations too. Hundreds of students from all places and levels of knowledge have joined these courses. You can see the full Chestnut Pies Enneagram Academy calendar of events at www.cpenneagram.com. Have you already subscribed for B and Yeranyu's YouTube channel? Go to YouTube and search for Chestnut Pies and click on like and subscribe. The Enneagram 2.0 podcast goes live every other Thursday on all main platforms. Stay tuned to learn more about yourself and others. Please click on like to help spread the word about our podcast. So what, what do you think is your next or latest challenge? What are you working on now? Keeping opening my heart. I still have a good way to go. I don't think that, you know, right now I'm very hopeful that I'll be able to keep my heart more open more frequently. I wish I can be blessed with... Um, you know, a capacity to have my heart permanently open, like I've been feeling these last days, you know, mm -hmm. when we do retreats or, you know, when we have good experiences, I get to experience this more permanent heart opening. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've been experiencing more of that in the whole of my life. But I don't think I'm yet in the place of being able to sustain that all the time and that's my willingness mm. well thank you for sharing that with us i think that sounds so important and i want to say i so appreciate you when you share your feelings with me even if those feelings are hard to hear in the moment because maybe you're disappointed in me or mad at me i'm not right now well i know you aren't right now thank goodness but when you are it's totally okay and i just want to say that even if we're in a hard moment or if i've done something inadvertently of course to hurt you or make you mad i just really appreciate it when you share whatever you're feeling and i'm working really hard on not having any kind of negative reaction to that because i so want you to know i want to support you in that and i want you to know how much i value the effort that you make 
uh, to express your your emotions to me in the moment. And I never want you to regret that because mm. I'm being reactive. So yes. I want to continue to to uh, to actively appreciate y- you for that and to support you in that because. Um, it just helps me understand what, what, what's going inside you more, which helps me um, separate out, you know, what, what's my stuff, uh, what I'm projecting onto you in the moment uh, unfairly, how I might be judging you based on either my own uh, reactions or my misunderstanding mm-hmm. of you. And so I just I really appreciate how much work you're doing on yourself and how that positively impacts me in so many ways, even mm-hmm. when it's a painful realization about myself in the moment. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, B. And um, I think I've been a slow learner of something, but I'm learning it, which is I when it's very hard to start expressing my feelings and sometimes depending on how hurt I felt by that person it's also hard after having expressed but the more I do the more I realize that by expressing what I'm feeling I feel better and sometimes it's during the moment I'm expressing my feelings that I already come back to a space of love, loving that person, you know, instead of feeling cold uh, towards that person. So I can't emphasize enough how it was important to me to learn this, that by expressing my feelings, going against all my cells when I do that, it's very counter-instinctive. Um, that helps me tremendously. I think you're really doing a service to the fives out there listening because sometimes when people are on a growth path and they're making these very difficult efforts, and let's face it, you know, self-development is is challenging. Uh, some fives, I think, can get stuck in a comfort zone. And some people, not only fives, can ask, well, you know, what's the benefit? Like sometimes when it's just hard and hard, it it doesn't, we don't always see the reward. And so I like that you're pointing out that there is a big reward for fives when they go against that self-protective tendency, which of course is totally understandable and natural to not share their feelings or to go inside or to take refuge in the mental space. I love that you're really highlighting from your own very poignant under experience that when you can make that effort to express more emotions or stay more in your heart, even if it's painful or if it's if it's expressing anger or hurt, that there is relief, that there is a positive experience of maybe even freedom um, and being more connected to yourself, uh, that happens. Yeah, thank you, B. Anything else that I haven't asked about that that you think it's important for people to know about type five and the growth path Mm. or have we covered it all um i think we cover we cover you know there there would always be more things to say but i think we covered the most important ones so my last piece is more practical and it is finding a balance between being direct and objective because we appreciate that when you communicate with us and being sensitive, gentle. So it's like a ballet between ballet, ballet <laughs> between the two ways of communicating. And it's also a ballet between being a little more distant and a little closer. But, you know, the ruler for fives is different than yours. <laughs> so more distant from... The for yardstick other... for measuring distance might be different, yes. Yeah, so for, um, for uh, you know, other people going more distant is measured in meters or f- several feet, while for fives is centimeters or inches. Oh. And cl- also closer, getting closer. It's just this tiny little bit closer, you know, because we are way too sensitive or right. more distant, just a tiny little bit, you know. And yes. So 
calibration. Yes, I know in our professional workshops, we sometimes model the dance that happens between fives and others for for the for our students and I will like move my foot away from you like three inches <laughs> and you'll say that devastated me <laughs> or I'll I'll move toward you like uh, three centimeters and you'll say oop now I need to move back a little. <laughs> and so that's important. Another thing I want to highlight that you said in one of our professional workshops last week that I thought I learned a lot from, which is uh, when we were talking about when you're working with a five, like let's say you're coaching a five or you're, you're a therapist and you're doing therapy with fives, it was really important to hear, hear for me to hear you say that fives don't always want support. Like, especially the way a heart type might give it, you know, that you want directness. And so I want to highlight this, what you just said. Or, or praise. Or praise. We don't need it. Ah, yeah. yeah. You don't need to pra- praise or support. You more need us to be direct. Yes. And loving. Right. So the, the gentleness, the patience, the sensitivity that you said is very important. But at times... It may be that you need us to be direct with you. And that applies to therapists, coaches, friends who want to give us advice. Go straight to the point. But be gentle, be loving, model that for us. And accepting. Yeah. And and have a sense that five's inner experience might be different than yours if you're not a five. Yes. Yes. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much. So now it's time for our top five. And today, our top five is going to address the the top five qualities we appreciate the most about fives who are truly working on themselves, who are really on a path of self-development. So not qualities that you see in all fives, but uh, in fives doing the work. Yes, exactly. Fives who are committed to their personal growth, who are really on an intentional uh, path of inner development. And if I may say something, I really like this uh, top five um, because, to be very honest, I'm a little bit fed up uh, with uh, approaches that praise the qualities the personalities have. Right. Like saying what is good about being in your ego. Yes. Like I hate when people say, I mean, right now in my moment, Yeah. Uh, I hate when people say that a good quality of fives is being calm in crisis. Yes. Or other qualities like being patient or, you know, whatever. Because I know how this comes from my avarice. Right. And from my ego. And I don't want that anymore. Right. So and what is Enneagram work? Are we stimulating people to just praise good sides of the worst uh, in them, which is ego and personality? Or are we really up to do inner work and self-development work? Courageous one. Yes. Uh, and and as, as, as people, listeners may know, we are uh, very committed to challenging the ego. And of course, we need support when we're doing the work of challenging the ego. But it's very important that we are confronting ego and naming ego as ego. Right. So uh, would you like me to start or do you want to start? You can start. Okay. What is your fifth, uh, uh, five uh, quality when fives do inner work that you appreciate? So my number five quality that I appreciate when fives are really doing inner work is their ability to be more humble about what they don't know. Mm. Yeah, because in ego, we tend to be arrogant. And that is, of course, a defense against feeling less than, feeling, you know, the superiority complex is sometimes hiding out the inferiority complex. Right. And although probably most true about social fives like you, that there's a desire to know things and be someone who has the identity or the persona of knowing everything, uh, I think it's it's really good when fives can admit they don't know something or not have to be someone who has all the information or data or knowledge about a given topic. Yes. What about you? What's your what's your number five quality? Uh, it's being in the body. Ah. It's 
being able to be grounded, to feel strong inside my body, to feel, you know, that I'm not only a head. Yeah. I, you know, I think I'm talking about things that make me feel better with myself because I am a five. And I, and I, but I also appreciate seeing fives who are in their bodies. Right. Yep. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. I like that one. What is your fourth? Number so, four. So my fourth is um, the courage to connect more with emotions. Uh, which sometimes starts with um, the courage to observe and and recognize when they disconnect from emotions and then work toward uh, being more in their emotions and expressing more emotions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mine is about connection, but with people. So it's sustaining connection in relationships and with people. And, and, you know, valuing people as people and not as objects we can learn from. You know, it's scary to me to see how we can have an, an, a, a utilitarian view of people. Just to learn from, you know, that scares me. It's a shadow, especially for me as a social five. So sustaining connection with people is quite important. It's my fourth. So my third is the ability and the willingness to challenge the belief in scarcity. Mm. I think that can be a hard, a hard one because it can almost seem like just a basic fact that mm. uh, fives inner resources are scarce, that they have only an, a certain amount of energy. So I think when they can challenge that, I think it's it's very healthy and, and, yeah. and, and something that, leave, that makes them be more open uh, to giving and receiving and being connected. And I apologize for the times that because I was not doing that, you felt hurt because I know that sometimes after a workshop, you just want to have a nice time in a dinner or celebrate and after a, a retreat. And many times I have this uh, tendency to retreat back and that hurts. And I now see how it can hurt many people in my life by doing that, you know, not being available to myself and them. I really appreciate you working on being, just being more conscious That's of that. It's difficult. I'm not there yet, I think. Yeah, mm. yeah. So what's your next one? Yeah, my third is connecting to universal wisdom instead of hoarding knowledge inside myself. It's a wonderful sensation when I don't feel like I need to know anything about something and instead I open up my you know head but it's not the lower mental center it's a bit more what I consider to be the higher mental center so the subtle headspace mm -hmm. to being in touch with you know you know all the universal wisdom that exists I sometimes describe that as an upgrade in my system from the hard disk in the inside that tries to accumulate knowledge to the iCloud era in which I <laughs> right. go up there somewhere to be in touch with whatever I want to know and allow that to come down as a download and convey that to everyone else without needing to stay with that. That is a wonderful sensation. I like that. That's a really profound idea right there. What is your second? So my second is it's connected to number three, the ability to challenge the belief in scarcity. It's it's in some ways uh, the other side of that, which is the opening up to believing more in abundance. Mm. And in, in under the title abundance, I would include love, self-love, happiness, mm. yeah. um, the, the appreciation of love of other people. Um, when I see fives doing that, I just think it's very courageous because mm -hmm. of the belief in scarcity. And I know mm -hmm. you've told me that there's a fear of abundance mm -hmm. and a difficulty letting that in. So 
when I when I see you or another five doing that, I think it's it's just very brave. Yes, it is and difficult, um, but doable. Um, I think we have this minimalistic tendency, or something that we could we could call the tendency to to live without. Right. You know, without anything, and when we open up to more, you know, get rid of the economy of scarcity and uh, get into the economy of abundance, then many things shift for better. But yeah. my second um, on the top five is heart opening. So it's a wonderful, difficult, but wonderful sensation of having the heart open. That's great. As simple as that. Yeah, yeah. What is your first? I'm curious. My first is... Uh, the efforts that fives on a path make to connect with other people. It's a little bit like your number four, uh, to connect with with people uh, and and get out of their usual comfort zone. Because when, I, when I've done Enneagram panels, for instance, sometimes I've had fives on the panels that I think are at a little bit more basic level of awareness that almost can't find any reason not to, to to really open up and connect with others because it's like everything's fine like I've created my boundaries I've I'm gotten really good at controlling my life where I'm regulating my energy expenditure and keeping away people who might drain me and everything's fine so I really appreciate fives when they when they have a yearning and make more effort to connect with outside people uh, and this might mean sharing more of themselves uh, initiating contact, expressing emotions, uh, and getting out of the mental space uh, that can sometimes be a bypass for, I think, the nurturance that real emotional connection can actually provide. Yes, that's very important. Uh, it sounds really crucial. And I sometimes, you know, have a sense that what us fives do is because of the retracting back and isolating and going for less we shrink our hearts down and it's like we become smaller and that's also avarice and it's not needed you know yes. in most cases you know yeah and i want to just say one more thing about this i think i think sometimes i think when fives make an effort in this regard because it can be difficult sometimes we non-fives don't recognize mm. both that they're doing it or how, what a challenge it is and so um i think we need to be a little bit more supportive when that yeah. happens mm -hmm. and like you said more patient and meet the person there yeah and i appreciate your saying supportive and patient and not to praise or to congratulate it's not but at least I need, it's more like seeing me, mm. seeing and acknowledging what you're saying. Yeah. Now, my number one, it's very personal, I think, it's spontaneity. Because as it's been my lifetime quest, um, I think it's what, in my particular case, opened up the doors for all my previous four ones. You know, having a heart open and being more in a sustained connection and so on. So to me, it's being more spontaneous. Can I ask you a question about that? Because yeah. I know when we're doing work together, like when we're teaching together, you're actually the more spontaneous of the two of us, right? Mm -hmm. Like I like to have everything planned out. I tend to be a little more controlling because I'm anxious that will everything go right. Uh, but you're the one who's always kind of saying, you know, let's just go more with the flow. Let's be more spontaneous. So I think there is a way that I experience you as very spontaneous, but I think it's something different than what you're saying. No, I think that that um, is a little bit of what I'm saying. It's just that it's a quest. It's it's something newer to me. I see. If you knew me teaching back 15, 20 years ago, you wouldn't see that at all. I see. At 
Oh, my outlines for the trainings would be more detailed than yours. <gasps> be. Wow, I don't think I knew this. You're so <laughs> against my outlines yeah, that I yeah. thought you never liked outlines. I think it's part of my quest. And um, in my particular case, it's easier to do that in trainings that is to do that in life and that's I very see. social oh, I see. so you know? that's maybe the difference yeah. but it's a laboratory for me to do that in life i, I see. think i'm right now being spontaneous more much more easily but it's been a lifelong quest so it's my number one i understand and thank you for sharing all that thank you for sharing everything you shared in this podcast because i think not we don't always have the opportunity to talk to someone who has both done the inner work you have and who is still on that path and is humble on that path uh, enough to really share vulnerably about you know wh what what it is that you've done to grow yeah so thank you for staying uh, interested enough as i said and thank you uh, our listener who was also tuned in uh, to what we were saying and being truly interested so this has been the enneagram 2.0 podcast please tune in again where we will continue to talk about all things enneagram <laughs>